Florida's Negro War, Black Seminoles and the Second Seminole War, 1835 to 1842, an audiobook by Shaquem Ra, provided to the public by Amin Ra University, originally written by Anthony E. Dixon, with a foreword by Bruce E. Twyman. Forward by Bruce E. Twyman, Ph.D., author of The Black Seminole Legacy and North American Politics, 1693 to 1845, published by Howard University Press in 1999, editorial board member of Indian Voices. Scholars who conduct research on the Black Seminole people select one of the more controversial subjects in United States history. The genesis of the topic can be traced to the 17th century colonial power struggle between Britain and Spain. The scope of Dr. Dixon's research primarily covers the years from the administrations of George Washington to James Polk. During these years, national policy on the issue of slavery and the Black Seminoles was dominated by Southern presidents for 44 out of 56 years. Much of the writing, research, and scholarship on the subject have been influenced by this time period. And at times, there has been a glaring negligence in discussing the record of Black Seminoles. Dr. Dixon consequently believes it is essential to be especially cognizant of the role and contributions made by black Seminoles in the period of study. To this end, he conducts superb biographical sketches on key black Seminole leaders, Prophet Abraham, John Caesar, and John Horse. The issues of race and ethnicity permeate the topic of the black Seminoles. Writers who take on this very important subject must navigate through delicate racial interactions between Native Americans, Blacks, Whites, and Hispanic peoples. Dr. Dixon conducts his study with a sensitivity which too often has been absent. Because of the events and realities of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, the Seminole people came to be composed of multiple ethnic groups of Native Americans and Blacks. Even a superficial review of data on the topic covering 400 years suggests that it may not be possible to achieve a solid consensus on the ethnic identity of the Seminole nation. However, in this study, perhaps, the key goal and achievement of Dr. Dixon is in his treatment of the distinctions between these two groups. Also, Dr. Dixon reviews the existence of various groups of Africans and Blacks in satellite villages surrounding St. Augustine and Fort Mose. While he acknowledges their origins from many locations, he identifies the Congo region as contributing the greatest cultural influence. Dr. Anthony Dixon is a Florida commissioner for the National Gullah Geechee Heritage Corridor. This commission was created by the United States Congress to educate and inform the public about the impact of the Gullah Geechee people on American history and culture. The Black Seminole Genesis can be traced to the Gullah Geechee, who escaped from South Carolina to Florida. It is extremely important and valuable to taxpayers and academia for him to present his research at this time. He presents an authentic and unique perspective. The study and record of the Black Seminole is greatly enriched by his efforts. End of foreword. Introduction. From 1817 to 1858, the United States government engaged in a bitter conflict 
with the Seminole Nation. This conflict would result in three distinct wars. The first Seminole War lasted from 1817 to 1818 and is best defined as an expedition to suppress Seminoles and black resistance to the encroachment of the Georgia plantation system in the Florida Territory. The second Seminole War lasted from 1835 to 1842 and was conducted under the Indian Removal Act. This war was a result of the American Plantation Society's relentless efforts to enslave the black Seminole population. The third Seminole War lasted from 1855 to 1858 and it erupted as a result of the United States attempt to remove the last remnants of the Seminole Nation from their homes in the Everglades. Research indicates a gradual process by which the United States attempted to acquire the Florida Territory and rid itself of the Seminole population while enslaving those blacks who had become a part of or associated with the Seminole Nation. This book examines the involvement, leadership, and impact of black Seminoles during the Second Seminole War. In Florida, free blacks, runaway slaves, and blacks owned by Seminoles collectively became known as Black Seminoles. Black Seminoles either lived in separate communities near Seminole Indians or joined them by cohabitating or intermarriage. Throughout this cohabitation, Blacks became an integral part of Seminole life by taking positions as advisors, counselors, and trusted interpreters to the English who were rapidly advancing plantation society into territorial Florida. By the beginning of the Second Seminole War, Black Seminoles, unlike their Seminole Indian counterparts, were not given the opportunity to immigrate westward under the United States government's Indian Removal Act. The United States government's objective became to return as many Black Seminoles, if not all, to slavery. Therefore, it became the Black Seminoles objective to resist enslavement or re-enslavement for many on American plantations. By examining the origins and cultural aspects of Black Seminoles, this book establishes the autonomy of Black Seminoles from their Indian counterparts. Research concerning Black Seminoles' involvement throughout the war allows this book to reconstruct the Second Seminole War from the Black Seminoles perspective. It is clear that from the onset of the war, the United States government, military, and state militias grossly underestimated both the determination and the willingness of Black Seminoles to resist at all costs. Throughout the war, both United States military and political strategies were constructed and reconstructed to compensate for both the intensity with which Black Seminoles fought, as well as their political savvy during negotiations. This book has three primary goals. The first goal is to document the history of Black Seminole society, thus countering the tendency to characterize Blacks as wholly dependent upon Native Americans. The second goal is to examine the Second Seminole War from the Black Seminole's perspective. There have been several books on both the Second Seminole War and Black Seminoles. However, there has not been a comprehensive book that examines the Second Seminole War with a central focus on Black involvement. The third goal of this book is in essence a 
culmination of the first two. It is the assertion that the Second Seminole War was indeed a slave rebellion. Evidence will demonstrate that Seminoles in general resisted the enslavement of black Seminoles. Evidence will also demonstrate that the efforts of the U.S. military to place blacks in bondage were not only a major underlying theme throughout the war, but at various points, the primary objective. Thus, this book will shed light on the idea that the Second Seminole War was indeed the largest slave rebellion in United States history. Florida's Negro War, Black Seminoles and the Second War. Chapter One, Origins and Cultural Character of Black Seminoles. The earliest recorded evidence of blacks in Florida dates back to 1513 and relates to the Spanish exploration and settlement of Hispaniola. During this time, Spain declared exclusive sovereignty over land from the Florida Keys to Newfoundland and west to Mexico. In 1526, the Spanish settlement, San Miguel de Gaudape, near present-day Sapelo Sound, Georgia, was ostensibly the first colony with a number of African slaves. The Spaniards almost immediately became aware of the potential danger of an alliance of non-whites in Florida. And as a result, special legislation prohibited blacks from living and trading with Native Americans. However, due primarily to harsh living conditions worsened by disease and starvation, many slaves joined the Guale Indians' rebellion and began setting fires to the settlement. The rebellion eventually destroyed the colony. Those Africans who participated in the rebellion were assumed by the Spanish to have migrated to remote parts of Florida and blended into Native American communities. The Spanish would continue to be unsuccessful at establishing a permanent settlement and foothold in the southeast until 1565, when Pedro Menendez de Abiles established San Agustin, which is present day St. Augustine among the Timucua Indians. Menendez was granted permission through a royal charter to import 500 slaves. However, it appears that less than a hundred actually arrived with the Spanish settlers. The Guale would continue to resist Spanish encroachment and control throughout the 16th century. In 1576, a major revolt again occurred, which lasted for four years. Many of the Guale who participated were killed and 19 of their towns were destroyed by fire. In 1583, a black labor force was sent from St. Augustine to the settlement of Santa Elena, which is present-day Paris Island, to rebuild Santa Elena after the Spanish regained control of the area. Santa Elena became the northernmost settlement of the Spanish. The Guale would continue to rebel against the Spanish until 1597, when another series of revolts was suppressed. As a result, the Guale settlements, particularly on the coast, went into a long period of decline and were eventually transformed into mission sites. By the end of the 16th century, Spanish settlements particularly St. Augustine, were operating on a dwindling supply 
of slave labor and reliant upon Habana for imported enslaved workers. In the early 17th century, African slaves were in demand and were quite valuable in Florida. By 1606, Spanish Florida contained a hundred slaves of which 40 belonged directly to the Spanish crown. Spanish Florida would continue to rely upon the importation of black slaves from Habana. In 1618, Florida officials would again request slave laborers from Habana to replace the dwindling supply of slaves caused primarily by disease, starvation, and ceaseless exploitation. Throughout the mid-17th century, yellow fever and smallpox were especially prevalent in the area and deleterious to the health of black slaves as well as others. Spanish authority and exclusive control over the Southeast were challenged in 1670 with the establishment of an English colony in Charlestown, which will hereafter be referred to as Charleston, South Carolina. Disputes over uninhabited lands quickly developed between the British and Spanish crowns. Both the English and the Spanish understood the importance of blacks in their quest to develop and protect their interest in the region. Historians assert two distinct black communities began to evolve in Florida. Autonomous maroon settlements in the wilderness of Florida that cooperated with Spanish authorities in the area of present-day Pensacola in St. Augustine and a black settlement called Gracia Rio de Santa Teresa de Mose that increased its importance by diplomacy, trade, and information gathering. Three years prior to the establishment of Charleston, the Spanish governor reported the arrival of the first runaway slaves from the English in Carolina. It was reported that eight men, two women, and a small child had escaped in a boat to St. Augustine. Although the English both requested and demanded the return of the slaves, the Spanish welcomed their arrival. This trend would not only continue, but also increase to the degree that the Spanish king enacted the Edict of 1693, quote, granting liberty to all runaway slaves, the men as well as the women, so that by their example and by my liberality, others will do the same. Both communities established a relationship with the Spanish such that they aided in the protection of Spanish interests. Runaway slave advertisements and notices in South Carolina indicate that during the 1730s, approximately 57% of the runaways came from the Congo-Angola region. During the 1740s, the percentage of Congo-Angola runaways increased to 61%. Between 1735 and 1765, Congo natives made up the majority of the former slaves listed in the St. Augustine records of black marriages. Black maroon settlements in the wilderness existed by utilizing a pan-Africanist perspective in the social, political, religious, and military organization of their communities. These maroon communities established close relationships with the neighboring Native Americans. The two communities lived for the most part in harmony and provided the foundation for what would later become the Seminole Nation. Their culture was created by fusing various African traditions which resulted in a pan-Africanist ethos within the community. This type of pan-African culture existed with minimal European interference. 
these Pan-Africanist cultural traits manifested themselves in a variety of cultural forms that distinguished their communities from both Spanish society and Native American communities, regardless of their close proximity. Research has shown that these cultural traits were most prevalent in communication, artistic expression, and religion. The Maroon settlements used an African writing system to communicate amongst themselves, which was created by blending the dialects present in the community as a whole. In time, Maroon communities developed into separate settlements, villages, and towns adjacent to Native American settlements. The first noted town was Angola. It was located near present-day Tampa Bay along the Manatee River and was closely associated with a large community not adjacent but in the vicinity. Evidence such as a letter from British merchants suggest the possibility of blacks inhabiting the region as early as 1772. However, higher concentrations of their society seem to be found in the Alacua, Gainesville, Florida region. In fact, during the Patriot War from 1812 to 1814, larger numbers of blacks were noted as fleeing the Alacua County region after thwarting the attempts of Georgia planters to subdue them. On the Manatee River, Angola provided blacks with access to the Caribbean, Cuban merchants, and the broader Atlantic region. Also, lines of communication with Spanish officials in Havana were strengthened through Cuban merchants. It was these merchants' records, fishermen primarily, that revealed the name Angola as being utilized to refer to this black settlement. By 1818, Angola's existence was known by the United States, Spanish, and the British authorities. In 1821, Angola was destroyed by the United States. Its inhabitants had no choice they either fled south to the Florida Keys where they were taken to the Bahamas with the aid of the Spanish or resettled to the immediate east, just north of present-day Barto on the Peace River in closer proximity to Native Americans. This settlement was known as Manati. Native Americans who also fled the Alakua County region relocated to the east of Angola along the Peace River in present-day Polk County. These particular Native Americans became known as Seminoles, thus those blacks affiliated with them became known as Black Seminoles, and a closer examination of their relationship will be discussed in the following chapter. By the advent of the Second Seminole War in 1835, there were five distinct Black Seminole towns in which the majority of the Black Seminole population lived. They were the Peliklaka, the King Hajo's Town, Bucker Woman's Town, Mulatto Girl's Town, and Manati. Archaeological findings at Peliklaka provide insight into Black Seminole culture. These findings reveal how this city differed from both Seminole and plantation communities. The first example is the non-geometrical layout of the town, unlike the family homestead of the Seminole or the normal layout or linear style of the slave quarters in plantation society. The second example relates to the pottery found. Triangular shapes on the rim shards recovered at Peliklakla were not recorded at nearby Seminole sites. It has been suggested that these markings were individualistic creations of black Seminoles. These markings indicate an African presence, given that identical triangular markings were found on 18th and 19th century Ghanaian pottery. A surface survey of Peliklakla uncovered a black glass bead. Green and clear beads were later discovered Blue beads were also found on various plantations and in African-American burial sites in North America, including Seminole City such as Wikiwachi and the Fort Brook Cemetery. Although the particular spiritual usage of beads in Black Seminole culture is not known, 
their frequent usage as adornments for pouches and clothing has been established. Throughout the shift from black settlements to black Seminole villages and towns, the blacks maintained their Afro-Indigenous religious values. Throughout the black settlements and the black Seminole villages and towns, shrines and altars dedicated to various deities and ancestors were located according to the practices of their faith. These deities were fed while women would extract their breast milk to place on the tombs of deceased children. The dead were buried facing the east during religious ceremonies and worship services, call and response and counterclockwise dancing and singing were commonplace, all of which are traditional African religious expressions. Known African cultural retentions, particularly in the area of religious expression, seem to confirm a strong tie to West Africa. For example, the act of naming a child was considered a religious matter that warranted a ritual ceremony in many West African cultures. Historical evidence clearly suggests a strong Congo-Angolan region influence in Black Seminole culture, especially in the practice of naming. Although, quote, slave names such as Pompey, Scipio, Caesar, Primus, Venus, Diana, and Daphne were more prevalent among the list of Blacks immigrating from Florida to Oklahoma, West African names such as Dimbo, Dindi, Kufi, Mungo, Juba, Kwako, Kujo, Suke, and Rina were also noted. Words of Congo Angola origin comprise approximately 40% of Gullah dialect items, of which the Black Seminole, Afro Seminole Creole, is derived. The Black Seminole name Dindi was an African derived word in the Gullah language meaning small child and was used to express endearment between boys and girls. The word Dindi is also listed as meaning child in the Gullah language. The Afro Seminole Creole language is an English related Creole. It is a descendant or derivative of the Gullah language due primarily to the isolation of Black Seminoles, the Afro-Seminole Creole language, ASC hereafter, has retained, to a large degree, Gullah terms. In linguistics, creolization is defined as a process by which a new language develops through the interaction of communicators who do not have a common language. In the case of the Black Seminoles, ASC's earliest formations included a creolization of English and a mixture of West African languages. ASC is considered to be, quote, almost identical to the conservative Gullah of a century ago, but it does not have the non-English sounds which Gullah has. The African influence on Gullah is reflected in the incorporation of Sierra Leone Creole and Mende terms. However, Mende did not have a strong presence in Sierra Leone until after 1800. Therefore, Mende words are not found in ASC, as it was formed prior to 1800. Linguistic research indicates that both the similarities as well as the differences between the two languages can be identified. Examples are in the Gullah language, we say e na shum or e an shum. In American Creole, we say e na shum. In English, we say he did not see her. Another example in Gullah, we say e ein guin shum. In American Creole, we say e nen shum or e na guin shum. In English, we say he won't see her. In example one, both Gullah and ASC utilize E as the pronoun he, she, or it, as well as the word na, meaning not or doesn't in English. In the Gullah translation, there are two sentences demonstrating the change in the language and the adoption of the word ain't, spelled as ein, A-I-N. It has been shown that the creolization of Gullah resulted from the infusion of more derivatives from the English language. 
Example two further demonstrates the adaptation or adaption of ain or ein or ain't in Gullah, while American Seminole Creole maintains a closer African cultural connection with an African based dialect. For example, in English, we would ask, where did those women hear that you didn't want to go to John's house with us? In American Seminole Creole, we would say, Da wisa de omen dim bin yeti she hamana on one far got to John house with we. And in Creole, we would say something similar, Na use de omen dim bin yeri she una no bin wa fo go na John house with we. In this translation of modern American Seminole Creole or Afro Seminole Creole, the word modern is pertinent here because the translation is derived from the studies of black Seminoles in 20th century Texas. By examining the Afro Seminole Creole language, we are afforded the ability to trace black Seminoles migratory patterns. The first pattern is from South Carolina to Georgia. From 1670 to 1749, both states relied heavily upon West African slaves. It is in this area that Gullah was formed in North America. Pattern number two, St. Augustine. Afro-Seminole Creole language is noted among the runaway slaves in St. Augustine in 1699. Pattern number three, Andros Island. From 1812 to the mid 19th century, black Seminoles began to take residence on Andros Island. Today, black Seminoles live there at Red Bay. The fourth pattern is Negro Fort. In 1816, black Seminoles are recorded living in the Northwest area of Florida. The Negro Fort will be discussed later in the study. Juana Bacoa, Cuba is the fifth pattern. Around 1820, black Seminoles are reported to have begun arriving and settling near Havana in Guanabacoa. It is important to note that these areas are not the sole locations for black Seminoles in Florida, but areas where they were highly concentrated and where African Seminole Creole was highly visible. In 1739, Governor Manuel de Montiano officially established the town of Garcia Rio de Saint Teresa de Mose, Fort Mose hereafter, approximately two miles north of St. Augustine. Fort Mose was located at the head of Mose Creek, a tributary of North River, which provided an abundance of shellfish and saltwater fish. Freedmen planted in the fields nearby while smaller maroon communities developed in the vicinity. By the time Fort Mose became an official town, St. Augustine had already earned the reputation of being a safe haven for runaway slaves. Thus, in August 1739, word from Native American allies in the nearby areas reached Montiano confirming that the British had attempted to erect a fort in the Apalichi region northwest of St. Augustine. But the blacks revolted, murdered all the whites, and escaped. These runaways, days later, would seek directions to the Spanish from Native Americans they met in the wooded areas of Florida. Fort Mose became quickly known as the center of black freedom for runaways and a village of new converts as all residents received some type of Catholic instruction. In the following year, Georgia Governor James Oglethorpe invaded Florida, wreaking havoc on Spanish communities in the territory. Although Governor Oglethorpe's invasion was unsuccessful, many Spanish forts and settlements were destroyed, including Fort Mose. For the next 12 years, inhabitants of Fort Mose lived among the Spanish in St. Augustine. The small maroon communities that existed in the wooded areas surrounding Fort Mose were forced to flee further into the woods and join other maroon societies or Indian settlements. Research has shown 
that during this time, Florida's black culture was infused with Spanish values, including Catholicism. For those blacks who relocated to St. Augustine, a bond formed between the important members of both communities. Due to the fact that there were always a lower number of female runaways, black males looked to Native American free or enslaved women in St. Augustine for companionship. Interracial relationships commonly existed in St. Augustine, whether through cohabitation or formal marriages. For example, there's the story of Thomas Chrysostomo. Thomas Chrysostomo and his first wife were Congo slaves belonging to different people. In 1745, they wed in St. Augustine. Pedro Grosales and his free wife Maria were the godparents at the wedding. By 1759, Thomas was a free widower. In the following year, he married a widow by the name of Maria Francisca. Thomas' godfather had also gained his freedom by this time. However, his wife and at least four of their children were still slaves in St. Augustine. The line between slave and free was altered and crossed in marriage, seldom without difficulties. Mutual obligations were understood and honored by both groups. Many of the blacks in and around St. Augustine also had extensive contact with English and Yamasee cultures. Therefore, what research discovers is that due to the frequent interaction of members of Fort Mose with St. Augustine residents, those particular blacks were exposed to outside cultures much more broadly. As a result, more cultural diversity was incorporated into their African-centered traditions. Also, once Blacks gained their freedom, they closely associated themselves with various Indian tribes and cultures. There were objections to Blacks living in St. Augustine. Poor Spaniards viewed the relocation of Blacks as competition or competition of wage labor. There is little doubt that racial prejudice also became a factor. In 1749, the new governor, Melchor de Navarrete, decided to rebuild Fort Mose. In 1752, when Governor Fulgencio Garcia de Solis attempted to remove blacks to Fort Mose, he faced stern opposition. Governor Garcia de Solis reported to the Crown that black opposition to their return to Fort Mose was not founded in fear of attacks but by their desire to live in complete liberty. This raises questions as to the validity of historical descriptions depicting Fort Mose as a free black town. Evidence of forced labor and forced conversion to Catholicism has caused researchers to question the freedom of those blacks at Fort Mose. The evidence of acculturation suggests that if these blacks were not indeed re-enslaved, they certainly did not enjoy the same freedoms. Regardless of the exact status of the blacks at Fort Mose, blacks in and around Fort Mose were involved in a cultural adaptation process that mixed African, English, Spanish, and a number of Native American cultures. Archaeological research uncovered artifacts of material culture that demonstrate the cultural adaptation process. For example, a handmade proter medal was found that depicted St. Christopher on one side while the other had a pattern resembling the Congo star. Thus, much like their black counterparts in the wilderness, blacks who remained in close and constant contact maintained African cultural ties, particularly with the Congo. Regardless of the contact with larger outside cultures, Blacks continue to develop and maintain their own cultural identities.
1763, Florida was occupied and controlled by the British for the first time in approximately 20 years. During this time, the majority of blacks associated with St. Augustine and Fort Mose relocated to Cuba. All of the inhabitants of Fort Mose were relocated. In 1784, when the British returned, blacks also returned. However, how many blacks returned who were occupants of Fort Mose is not known. Fort Mose was never reestablished. Although the Spanish returned and established control in Florida again, blacks had begun to foster a close relationship with the Native Americans in the region who had by now begun a new Indian nation known as the Seminole. Black maroon settlements were established in close proximity to Seminole settlements, villages, and towns. In time, they became known as the Black Seminoles. Black Seminoles would eventually come in contact with Fort Mose descendants through trade, thus exposing Black Seminoles in Florida to various aspects of Caribbean culture, particularly material culture. From their initial arrival in the 16th century, blacks began to upsond from European authorities and establish maroon societies in the Florida wilderness. As the Spanish began to establish settlements and control of Florida, blacks began to increase in number. In the 17th century, Spanish control in the region was threatened with the establishment of English colonies in South Carolina. In 1687, Spanish officials reported the first runaways from the nearby English settlements. The Spanish crown, interested in maintaining control in the southeast, began to encourage runaways from English settlements and colonies. As a result, two distinct black communities evolved. Two distinct black communities evolved. Those runaway slaves who remained in the Florida wilderness established communities and relationships with nearby Native Americans and Spanish authorities. They developed an African-based culture which incorporated Native American and Spanish cultures. Although they lived in closer proximity to Native Americans, they maintained a closer identity to West Africa. This culture included material objects such as pottery and object scripts, as well as language. As early as 1739, fugitive slaves were settling at Fort Mose, located just outside of present-day St. Augustine. Blacks agreed to help defend St. Augustine from outside European invasion in exchange for certain liberties. The protection served three primary functions. One, to maintain a social and strategic relationship with the Spanish. Two, to maintain the Spanish foothold in St. Augustine. And three, to advance blacks within Spanish society. The Spanish provided food until the first crops were harvested, a priest for religious instruction, and established a military unit. Arguably, Fort Mose was the first free black settlement in what would become the United States of America. At Fort Mose, blacks would create a culture that wove together African, Native American, and Spanish elements. However, this particular community was transported to Cuba. Over time, runaway slaves began to prosper and increase in numbers. Blacks either lived in separate communities near Seminole Indians or joined them by cohabitating or intermarriage. Thus, they became known as Black Seminoles, a nation within a nation. Black Seminoles would continue to exist with an African-inspired culture that included a mixture of Spanish, English, and Native American components. 